On Monday, the Center for Disease Control encouraged people to start wearing masks again in order to slow the spread of the season's main respiratory illnesses, COVID, flu, and RSV. This year's flu season is off the charts, already having broken records for the number of positive tests reported in a single week during any flu season on record since 1997. The trajectory of this year is similar to the relatively bad season of 2019-2020, which immediately preceded the COVID pandemic. Joining us now to discuss is senior scholar at John Hopkins Center for Health Security, Health Security Dr. Amish Adalja. Welcome, doctor. Thanks for having me. So why is the flu so bad this season? I, I remember you know, conversations about COVID outcompeting the flu and us really not having a very bad uh, flu year during the pandemic, I, I suspect because our, the mitigation efforts that we were taking that, didn't, you know, that couldn't quite kill COVID were actually effective enough against um, the flu. So are we, are we seeing a rebound because we're not you know, staying at home so much, we're eating out, we're going to work, et cetera? That's definitely part of it. As people socially interact back at their normal rate pre-pandemic, all of those respiratory viruses that were having difficulty spreading during uh, the time when people were wearing masks, when people were social distanced, when people were eating outdoors, for example, those are coming back. And in the interim, we've had a couple of seasons where people haven't been infected with flu. So some of that immunity that you get just from being exposed to it, that's a little bit lower. And we also have lower than expected vaccination rates against influenza. So it's kind of all of those things combined are causing this rise in flu and also uh, some of the explanation behind the rise in RSV as well. I have seen some discussion about whether or not uh, COVID, the longer term effects of having had COVID, potential immune effects are also part of what's making more vul people more vulnerable to other um, kinds of diseases in, in the flu. Is that a part of the picture or no? No, there's no evidence that COVID-19 alters your immunity or that, that the vaccine or anything to do with COVID-19 from a biological standpoint has anything to do with this. We all expected that we would see a rise in respiratory infections once people started to socially interact, and it could be worse than usual seasons, seasons because many people who would have gotten infected over a short period uh, are getting infected over a short period of time that probably would have been spread out. That's certainly the case for RSV, but there's no evidence that our immune systems are somehow damaged by COVID. It's just that we've had three years of less exposure, so more susceptibility in the population, and we have lower flu vaccination rates this season than prior. On Monday, Pfizer and its partner BioNTech announced they submitted an application to the FDA for authorization of the Omicron-adapted COVID booster for children ages six months to four years. It is currently authorized for ages five years and older in the U.S. and the EU. Now, there has been you know, some people are more skeptical that you know, kids of that age uh, necessarily need the vaccine, given how uh, you know, they don't they don't have nearly as bad outcomes from COVID as older populations. Uh, you know, where is, is your thinking in, in terms of uh, vaccination for this younger group? Well, I think that everybody should be vaccinated against COVID-19, but I have a separate position when it comes to who should be boosted. And I've always been somebody who's advocated boosters be targeted to high-risk individuals, those that are above the age of 60, 65, those with any high-risk conditions, irrespective of their age. So in this youngest age group, I think obviously there's going to be some children that are high risk. They're children with cancer, children who have mm -hmm. immune deficiencies, children that uh, have asthma. Those children are going to benefit from that, that bivalent booster. I think for the average healthy child or the average healthy adult, I think that boosters really only provide marginal benefit. I think we really needed to target boosters to high risk individuals. Those are the people who constitute the 300 to 400 people that die every day. Those people are under boosted. And I think diluting the message of boosting everybody really uh, takes away from the fact that we really need to focus on high risk individuals who continue to be hospitalized with COVID. Hmm. When I spoke to uh, Dr. Vinay Prasad a couple of months ago, you know, we were talking about the booster regime, you know, um, cycle that people maybe should or should not be on. And he was saying that, you know, we don't know yet how long the effects of the initial vaccine are going to last, but as long as they are lasting and until we see a spike in hospitalization rates and deaths, then it doesn't seem to me, his argument was that it wasn't as crucial um, to emphasize boosters, similar to it sounds like to what you're saying. It does seem, though, that we are experiencing some higher rates of hospitalization at the current moment. And I wonder what you make of how the public should start to make an assessment about when the general population should expect 
the efficacy of the initial vaccine dose to wear off and when there should be a more broad public conversation about when non-vulnerable people, non-especially vulnerable people anyway, should go ahead and get boosters. Well, right now, there is a universal booster recommendation that's been in place for some time. But I don't think that you're going to see in the healthy population erosion of protection against what matters, severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Because if you think about, for example, uh, somebody like me, 47 years old with no medical problems, my risk for hospitalization from COVID is very, very low. A booster is not going to really appreciably lower that. So what you have to really key the, the use of boosters is on erosion of protection against severe disease. And that's why I recommend boosting high-risk individuals, irrespective of their age, and boosting elderly individuals, because we know that's where we've seen some wearing off of this vaccine. I don't think you're going to see wearing off of this vaccine uh, in healthy populations in terms of severe disease, because the risk is already very, very low for severe disease in those without medical problems. And many people have gotten boosted naturally with hybrid immunity because they've gotten infected. So there's a lot more immunity mm. in, that, in that healthy population that's intact against severe disease that I don't think necessarily will change. You know, that's not a message I feel like I'm hearing from uh, U.S. health officials or health spokespeople in the government as much. I, 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 what I hear is a lot of stressing of, of getting boosted regardless. I, I don't hear so much, I don't think, and it, a, a more targeted approach. If you're elderly, that's when it's really important, or if you're immunocompromised or you have some health condition, uh, like what you said. Um, are our, do you think the the you know, the, the, the marketing, the comms people, the people in advocacy in the federal government are narrowly tailoring the message enough and, and would it be beneficial if they did? I definitely think it will be beneficial. You're starting to see sort of a pivot now where they're tweeting or talking about high risk individuals, elderly individuals, senior citizens, nursing homes being boosted, because that's actually what's going to change the trajectory of COVID-19. If you boost every 30 year old in this country, if you get 100%, that's not going to change anything. It's really about getting that 300 to 400 people who are dying every day down. And how do we do that? We make sure that they're fully boosted. We make sure that they have access to Paxlovid. Really focusing boosters and medical countermeasures on the high risk is how we move forward in this. So I do think that they kind of opted for this universal message, which I think is very diluted. And you have the 80-year-old thinking he should get boosted with just the same uh, energy as an 18-year-old. And that's not actually true. Uh, because we know one is at risk for severe disease, one is not. And I think this was a, a mistake uh, with the administration. And there was pushback. We saw FDA advisors resign over the, the booster uh, booster uh, decisions. We saw the, the CDC director override the ACIP for the second time ever in history because the ACIP wanted a more targeted booster campaign. But the administration wanted a universal booster vaccine. And I think that's, uh, that's where we are. And I just I want to really drive that point home. So you're saying that you know, the, the deaths we're seeing from COVID, the few hundred deaths every day, that is predominantly by and large in an in a elderly or immunocompromised or probably there's probably some morbid obesity or cancers or th those kinds of people. That's who are we're, who are still dying from COVID. Exactly. The, the deaths have shifted to the older age group, and that older age group is the one that needs to be maximally boosted. They need to have early access to Paxlovid. That's where we really need to work if we're going to, to get the death rate down even lower than it is now. And per the CDC's new recommendations to start masking, not just for COVID, but for these other, uh, for the flu and other respiratory diseases, uh, you know, what do you make of that recommendation? Obviously, it's become, masking itself has become politicized in the wake of COVID. Other parts of the world employ regular masking for sickness all the time without those same kind of political implications. Is that something that you would also recommend? I think if you're somebody that's high risk, you should be thinking about wearing masks when you're in crowded, congregated places that are indoors. That's always been a recommendation that we gave to the immunocompromised during respiratory viruses. And I think those types of recommendations make sense. Uh, a lot of these viruses are unavoidable. And for many people, they may be mild illnesses. But for high risk individuals, I do think that masks uh, can be useful. And I'm glad that the CDC is issuing a recommendation rather than seeing the return of mandates, which kind of get mired all into the politics of this pandemic and end up going nowhere. Mm. Well, Dr. Adalja, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. More Rising right after this.